questions. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our conversation on leverage, how philanthropists use new tools to create change. Um, at the Center for Strategic Philanthropy, we focus on improving the ROI of philanthropic capital. And there actually is a published list of philanthropy buzzwords that is put out by a scholar at Stanford. And leverage actually made it onto this list back in 2009. And yet, eight years later, we still can't stop talking about it. And why is that? And I think it's because we're grappling with uh, the, the truth that the problems that we're trying to solve with philanthropy are so big that they require changing an entire system. We need to involve governments, we need to involve investors, private companies, and we need new tools to do it. And we need more efficient operating models to do it as well. And in 2015, we saw that there was nearly $375 billion given away in the United States. And that's about 2% of our GDP, which can seem like a lot of money. However, it's dwarfed when we think about the problems that it's trying to solve. So in health, for instance, there's 9,500 diseases for which there are no treatments or cures. One in five children are growing up in poverty. Uh, in the environment, we're seeing extin extinction rates that are thousands of times higher than we've ever seen in history. So again, we can't think about business as usual. We need to be disruptive. We need leverage. We need to do things differently. And so we have a tremendous panel here today that is going to share their lessons learned as to how they are disrupting the system, how they are using uh, different levers to amplify their impact in the philanthropic world. So let me do some brief introductions for you. Um, all the way to my left, we have uh, Todd Wagner, uh, who is a serial entrepreneur and head of an organization called Charity Network that we'll hear a bit about. Uh, Todd co-founded Broadcast.com with Mark Cuban and, and sold it to Yahoo in 1999. He is a philanthropist, investor, mentor, entrepreneur, shaking up the world of philanthropy. Um, next, we have Brian Sheff, uh, who's the co-founder and president of Vista Equity Partners. He founded uh, an organization called Global Wildlife Conser um, Conservation, which we'll hear a bit about, which is dedicated to protecting endangered species. And to honor his dedication to uh, the environment, a lemur in Madagascar was named <laughs> Chef's Dwarf Lemur. Um, to my immediate right, we have Tom Meredith, who served in uh, several senior financial positions in the technology industry, including Dell Computers and Motorola. He is on the board of the Nature Conservancy uh, and um, has also spearheaded some environmental projects in, in Austin. And last but certainly not least, Marlo. Um, Marlo Gottfurt Longstreet is a, has described herself as a soccer mom, but you've turned into an entrepreneur, an advocate, and has started the Tanner Project Foundation, which is using philanthropy to change the way we think about diagnosing and managing disease. So thank you all so much for being here today. Um, so first I wanna start off um, by taking us all, taking us to your, your, your moment of disruption and, and thinking about why we have to do things differently and how we're going to do things differently. And, and I think many of you had your moments are characterized differently. Brian, I think your moment is characterized with enlightenment. Todd, yours with frustration. Marlo, yours is probably with both a combination of despair and hope. So Brian, why don't you start us off? Tell us about why is it so important to focus on the in, in environment, that, that moment when you realized this is something we have to do but we have to approach it differently. And why did you need to start GWC to do that in a, a field that already has sort of a lot of players in it? Yeah, it sure does. Uh, thank you, and thanks for saying that mine came from enlightenment. That's probably the best thing anyone said about me in a long time. <laughs> My background is in software and data, and so uh, when we were out of position and Vista had become somewhat successful, uh, I started thinking about some problems that we could use the organization that we'd built at Vista to help solve using software and data. And I was really struck through a great friendship that I have with a dear friend of mine who became the CEO of Global Wildlife, uh, the issues around species extinction and habitat destruction, and really understanding its impact uh, from a human standpoint, all the direct impacts on people who, indigenous or otherwise, who live in these areas where this is happening, and then on top of it, the global impact, the one that people recognize today is really around climate change and global warming. Uh, I just felt like, gosh, I need to get involved. And then when I dug into how I wanted to kind of use the technology aspects of Vista 
and really look towards some scientists who could help um, resolve, solve, and maybe help mitigate some of these issues. I found that many of the organizations that I went to talk to as a donor had a different perspective. And so thankfully I had this great friend uh, who was a scientist and involved in one of these large NGOs and he had a great network and we had this idea about creating a science only network where we could pull together about 20 scientists who formerly worked full time for these other NGOs and we would create, my wife and I would create this opportunity for them to kind of work full time for us, not be focused on development at all, and really partner leveraging their science and their relationships around the globe with local organizations to affect those things, you know, wildlife preservation and species preservation. Great. And can you just give us some of the quick data points about the actual ROI of investing in the environment? Yeah, it's one of these great things. And we're still, you know, working with financial institutions going towards financial leverage to help them understand, um, you know, how to, how to really account for this. But in a real dollar term, every billion dollars that we invest in environmental preservation has about 110x return. So as I told Mike, it's about the only way we can beat Mike's track record today is investing in our wilderness and our wildlife. Yeah. And that's in a form of variety of services that we get, not just clean water, clean air, and clean food, which are all pretty important, but actually direct uh, benefits to folks in terms of arable farmland, soil preservation, things like that. Great. So, Todd, I want to turn to you next. And uh, you often reference the definition of an entrepreneur when you are, are, are speaking. Uh, and uh, so I want to read the first part of this definition, that entrepreneurs are creators of new and destroyers of old. They are constantly in conflict with convention. Their beliefs precede results, and they see possibilities that are invisible to others. So, Todd, as, as you reached your... But, your then it, but then it goes on to say that they are found annoying to most people. And unemployable. <laughs> un unemployable. And, and when it does work, then they're copied, but they're always outside the establishment. So it's not all rosy. That's right. That's right. And it was attributed to Teddy Forsman, yep. who was a good friend, obviously, before he passed. But anyway, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so tell us about how you got to your point of, of your tipping point of, of disruption and, and why you wanted to start Charity Network and do things differently in the philanthropic space. Yeah, I mean, if it's OK, I need to go backwards before I go forwards here. I always, I always look at, at things as, I always say, if you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And the reason I say that is because your background defines how you look at how to solve a problem. We're all guilty of that. If you come from the medical world, you're gonna have a different take than if you come from the business world. It doesn't make you right or wrong. It's just the lens by which you inform what you do. So my background is obviously in technology. Therefore, I'm gonna look at things as a technologist would and think about what those changes might be. I've also been in the media business for the last 15 years with Mark. We own Landmark Theaters and 2929 Productions and Magnolia Pictures. So media has become an important part of my life, but so has philanthropy. So all three of those areas are, are things that I hope I know something about, but they're also incredibly near and dear to me. And so when I think about an issue, that's my lens. So in the world of nonprofits, I view many of them as very analog thinking businesses. What do I mean by that? Well. Broadcast.com was the beginning of digital, right? It was the beginning of streaming media, which eventually led to YouTube, which eventually leads to Netflix. You think of Uber. Uber is, is a business that is taking a very analog industry, which is taxi, and turning it into a digital business. What digital businesses typically do if they're run right is they make things more efficient. So what makes Uber better? Well, I know who's picking me up. I know how much it's going to cost me. I know where I'm going to go. I don't have to exchange money, et cetera, et cetera. So the digital world to me is the important one to find things that are sweet spots. So when, when I got into the philanthropy world 15 years ago, first, as a lot of entrepreneurs do, we try to fix it. We come in and think we're going to make it better. Then we find out how huge, how intractable, how complex these issues are, and we change tax. And for me, that meant that I was going to do everything I could to help identify over time the leaders in the space and try to raise money for them. I know we're going to talk during this panel today um, about kind of phase two of the things that I'd love to see happen. But phase one is the Charity Network is trying to move 501c3s, sometimes celebrities, sometimes brands, into a more digital way to raise money. Why? Because it's more efficient. 
So if you have the traditional gala that has 300 people, you can only get the word out so much, you can only raise so much money. But if we use the digital virtual stadium, which is what Charity Buzz does, all of a sudden you're able to access 200,000 people around the world who can bid on an item. That's an example of digital. We do the same thing with Prizio, which is an example of digital to reach millennials. And we do it through $10, $30, $50 donations. We did it for Lynn Miranda. We raised $7 million for the Hispanic Federation and Planned Parenthood by leveraging the power of digital. So that's, that's where we're at now, is trying to put in place an infrastructure that these organizations can plug into so that they don't feel like I'm getting passed behind. You know, our average donor age is going up. How do we stay relevant? We want to basically be there as that resource because as I always say, the ability to send an email and post on Twitter does not a digital strategy make. <laughs> and so we live in it every day, we do it every day, we think about it every day, and that's part of what we are trying to build now. Great, thanks, Todd. So, Marlo, I want to I want to go over to you. Um, if those of, some of you might have been in the a panel earlier this week where we talked about medical philanthropy, and you don't go to medical philanthropy. Medical philanthropy comes to you, and that was what happened in in, in your case. So, Marlo, you know, tell us about how your life changed overnight, and when you lost your son Tanner and were told that your daughter Casey had a 90% chance of developing cancer, how did you think about how do I use my philanthropy, how do I use my resources to actually change the situation for my family and for, for others? How did you use that as leverage? Well, there's no rule book when you lose a child. And my son, this month is four years since he passed away. He was 10 years old, had a few days of headaches. You think your kid has the flu or a virus, and you go to the hospital and are told that he has a stage four glioblastoma. Um, when we were talking to different doctors, we had one doctor who asked us probably one of the most important questions, and that was, what is your family history? And at the time, my ex-husband's mother was the only one who had had cancer in the family. She had had breast cancer at a young age, and uh, around 32, and died at 49, and that was it. But it was enough of a red flag for this doctor to say breast cancer, brain cancer, something's going on here. And they tested Tanner for the mutant p53 gene. The mutant p53 gene, the p53 gene is something we all of us have. We get one from our mom, one from our dad, and it's the biggest tumor suppressor gene in our body and helps fight cancer. But if you have a mutated gene, it does just the opposite. Tanner had that gene, and we learned he inherited it from his father, my ex-husband. And like you said, my 18-year-old daughter has the gene, and as a woman, has an over 90% chance of getting cancer. Thankfully, she remains healthy, is going off to college in the fall. So our journey didn't end with Tanner's death. It is every day of keeping Casey healthy. And I am not in the business of <clears throat> accepting your son, your child has this um, disease, and there's nothing we can do about it. I knew we had to do something about it when it came to Casey. So my father and I started Tanner Project Foundation, and we worked with the J. Craig Venter Institute in La Jolla, California, and we work with Dr. Craig Venter, who is the father of the human genome. He's the first person to sequence the human genome. And we told him our story. We won't accept this. I will not, as a mom, go through this again. So I had a choice. Do I do nothing or do I do something? And I'm the kind of person I was raised to do something. And so with the foundation, we have an NF1 project where we study Casey. And it's all about catching cancer before it becomes cancer at stage zero and early detection and learning from Casey. Because what we learn from Casey today will help others tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And my whole being is educating people and letting people know that if this could happen to me, to our family, it could happen to anyone. And it's really important people realize that no one's immune to this. And we just only had one cancer in our family. So genetics, genomics, all of that is so important. And um, that's why I do what I do every day. Great. Thanks, Marla. So Tom, I want you to, to jump in here now as we're, we're thinking about, uh, you know, as philanthropists, what are the different levers that, that we can pull that are going to help to amplify impact? So we started to hear a, a little bit about it with technology, um, sort of with this advocacy, storytelling, financial innovation is a way to, to get more leverage. From where you sit, what do you think are some of the most um, highest ROI levers that, that philanthropists and nonprofits can use? 
that's a long conversation, <laughs> but in short, I would say there's collaboration, and I think what uh, we're hearing is that we're looking at a world that's rapidly evolving. Giving is limited in terms of its ability to solve really wicked problems if we're acting individually. Um, I, I think um, we underestimate the power of storytelling. I think that the story you just told is fairly um, compelling, I don't know how to say it, and sad, but it's a motivator. Right. I believe that technology, as Todd points out, and the science-based, fact-based decision-making, you can't be in business in today's environment and not be at least fact-based. However, I also recognize um, that the definition of an entrepreneur is best summarized by all progress is due to the unreasonable person. And they're constantly being told, no, that's not going to work. But it's the person who has the temerity, the courage to go forward and say, no, we can make this work. Feasibility studies probably are not really helpful. Um, because you're trying to solve wicked problems. I believe that um, you can't approach philanthropy historically the way we have. I believe that um, another leverage point is consolidation. There are so many foundations, 1.5, 1.6 million foundations just in the United States. In Austin, Texas, we have more foundations per capita than any other city in the country. Um, is that really a viable outcome? And I would suggest no. We are not, because each one of those probably has an ED or executive director or CEO who's struggling to make a payroll for themselves and maybe one or two staff. And imagine if they had actually one set of staff that were really highly paid, when that would be another <laughs> perhaps breakthrough thought. We should be, if we're trying to solve the world's wicked problems, then why aren't we paying the people who are trying to solve them salaries that weren't just that? Um, we don't advertise, be another thing that we could talk about. Um, so, for example, I think Susan S. G. Komen, or S. G. Komen Foundation advertises about two plus million dollars a year. Uh, I think Mars Candy is about 690 million. I believe L'Oreal, let's go to L'Oreal, is over two billion. Fundraising, I mean, fundraisers should get paid handsomely because they're the lifeblood of philanthropy. They are the relationships. They are sales. The lifeblood of every organization is ultimately sales. And I'll just stop there. Right. You, gave, you gave us a lot to think about, Tom. And we're actually going to come back to a number, a number of those issues. But, but let me toss it back over to the, to the left-hand side here. Um, and, and, and Brian, let, let's pick up on this thread of technology. Because at, at Vista, you have nearly a $30 billion fund, and you're investing in technology. And you've seen a ton of software and data companies and apps and, and all of that. How, how do you think nonprofits can use technology better? Are we investing enough in technology? How can we make better use of it? I think it's a little bit generational. Uh, you know, I've seen the same thing since I moved to Austin. It's, it's encouraging on the one hand from a cultural standpoint that people are so impassioned, they want to get involved. And on the other, I think uh, it's tremendously inefficient. And part of what, if you use it wisely, software can do for you is, is maybe bring some best practices and workflow to organizations. Um, unfortunately, I think a lot of people don't know how to use technology really effectively. Uh, one of the things that you guys do really well is, uh, is educate people on the power of technology and nonprofit. But really, technology should, uh, and software in particular, uh, which is the only technology I think that matters anymore, uh, should really drive you know, best practices and workflow. The idea is you know, somebody somewhere has probably figured out how to do most of what we're trying to do already and they've probably codified it in some way shape or form and you can probably take advantage of that secondly distribution i think what todd does and, and after he and i met last year i got the head of our foundation involved and i actually think we just used him recently at a fundraiser we just did and it was tremendously successful it makes all the sense in the world technology in this case charity buzz actually gave us a much broader reach than the 600 people who were at our gala i think we had 60,000 people online for a couple of the items that we were trying to auction off it makes a ton of sense and not lastly it provides a community and i think that's mm -hmm. maybe the most exciting aspect of many of the new more social media esque technologies today is bringing great ideas at the end of the day the human capital and all these entrepreneurs out there are going to drive these changes mm -hmm. And so if you have an idea, if you're impassioned, if you have something that you think is maybe uncommon, unique, or rare, um, you might be surprised that a community has developed worldwide and now has access to you and your story and what's going on. And you can actually learn from their experiences. 
So I think those are the three areas that we use technology. Great, and uh, Todd, can I ask you to jump in here sure. as well? Because you're really sitting at the, the intersection of technology and media. We've talked about tech, we've talked about storytelling. H how do you think about not only in your own platform, but the companies that you're investing in, how, how could you help an organization like Panner Project Foundation? Right, I mean, again, to me, you have to think about how technology gets used. So let's back up a step again. So let's look at Amazon 20 years ago. When Jeff started that company and he put a few books online, I doubt anybody said, well, that's going to change retail. <laughs> but 20 years later, we have had a tipping point. And I'm sure you guys are aware of this. Over 50% of goods are now bought online. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean all the brick and mortar stores are out of business? No. Is it impacting brick and mortar stores? Absolutely. Is it going to continue to impact those businesses? Absolutely. So when, when you think about technology, I always say the first iteration copies what it used to be. So let's talk about Netflix for a second and Reed Hastings. When they first started shipping DVDs in the mail, did you go, wow, that's an amazing idea? Mm -hmm. I didn't. <laughs> I mean, it was taking old media and using the US Postal Service to send something, but it never stops there, right? It's always the next thing. And now, obviously, it's streaming media, and now, they are spending $6 billion a year on content. They are gonna impact the movie industry more than anything that we have seen over the last 10, 20 years. So now let's talk about this industry. What I love is finally it's being talked about. And Tom touched on it, and I know we're gonna talk about it more, but it is my favorite topic, <laughs> which is there are too many nonprofits. It has been impolite for a very long time to say that because they are well-intentioned. I unfortunately think that if we're serious about solving problems, we have to stop being polite about it and call it what it is. In the for-profit world, if your company is inefficient, guess what? You don't raise capital and you go out of business. You either merge or you get bought. I believe that in the nonprofit sector, it is time to start having these conversations. I think it is time for us to be able to say, that we don't need, and I don't know what the exact number is, and I've heard a ton of different numbers. We don't need 100 breast cancer charities. Maybe if we knew which were the best five, we could allocate monies to those, and those would be the most successful. So one of the things I talk a lot about, and I will always talk about is, and again, this goes back to how I said it, so please forgive me, hammer and a nail, this is the world I come from, so this is how I see it, is why don't we have subject matter experts? Why don't we take a page out of the public equity markets where we have folks from JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley and everyone else telling us, you should own this stock, you should own this stock. These are the metrics that we think you should look at. I don't have to agree with them, but I have 50 different metrics on, back to my Netflix. Gee, they expanded into 10 more countries. All of a sudden, you know, they've got 10 million new subscribers. I'm getting metrics for me to make a decision. In the nonprofit world, there is one silly metric, and I know Tom agrees with me because we were on the phone together, which is <laughs> overhead and allocation of program expenses. Yeah. That's just the silliest, most trivial statistic that you could possibly imagine. I agree. Great. From the world I come from, you would get laughed out of the room. But that is, and people will say it with a straight face, well, that's a good organization, 89% of the money. Are you kidding me? But that's the part that I think needs to change. And we need the heft, though, of the JP Morgans and the Goldmans and the others who have deep subject matter experts. Because if one of you right now afterwards said, hey, Todd, what's the five best veterans charities? I don't know. I really don't know. Because all the analysis is done on the expense side. There's never analysis on the revenue side, on the sales side. of the. And, and when people say, well, Todd, you don't understand. It's really hard. It's like, no, going to the moon is really hard. <laughs> we can figure this out. Um, we just have to have the will to figure it out. So anyway, sorry to jump, but that's, 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 a, that's a okay. I, I, I'm not going to stand in front of a moving train. So, um, <laughs> so, uh, so Tom, uh, I'm sure you want to jump in here. So wh what, what else would you like to, to, to add there to this? There are one and a half million nonprofits, 600,000 600, of them in the U.S. have less than a million dollars in, in revenue. What do you think we can do to make this system more efficient? I could be the second moving train. <laughs> um, let's, let's talk about compensation. Um, if you're a recent law grad um, from a top 10 school, your starting salary in one of the major cities in the United States this last year in September was probably around $200,000. If you're a graduate from a top tier MBA school, let's 
pick Stanford, for example, or HBS, your starting salary on average was probably about $400,000 a year. Um, if you're a graduate of the MBA school and you're male, you probably are almost uh, 20 or 29, maybe 30 at that point. If you're a woman, you may be two years younger. And if you're out of law school, you're probably 25 years old. Um, you could hire um, probably all but 10% of the top um, CEOs or executive directors of the largest philanthropies in the country with that salary. Um, that's criminal. And I really mean it. it's criminal because we are asking these people to actually work in the world of nonprofit, which we think is highly valued, and they're literally doing the Lord's work. They're doing good. Um, but they're not doing well economically. So where do we think all the best talent ends up? Not in those jobs unless they are already living lives of privilege or they decided they want to give their lives to public service. But why are we forcing them to choose? I would say that's a huge issue for us. So how do we change it? How does, um, how does this group play a role in changing that? I, I think, um, well, for example, in Austin, Texas, um, we recruited somebody to the Water Creek Conservancy, which is a $500 million philanthropic effort, public-private partnership between the city of Austin and a group of individuals, of which I am a co-founder. And as part of that, I was told, well, we need to do a feasibility study because we're never going to be able to do this. Austin will never support it. Um, and we can't pay anybody more than $150,000. To which I said, no, we're not going to do a feasibility study because I believe we could actually convince people this was going to be great because it was going to connect East and West Austin, North and South Austin, and East and West, by the way, is people of color and people not of color. And I also believed that we could hire somebody and pay them more money. And I recruited a terrific individual, a guy named Peter Mullen, who was the number two deputy at the High Line in New York. And he had been there for 14 years, four as a volunteer and 10 as the guy. Uh, the number two guy. And we paid him a lot more than that. And frankly, um, it was controversial. But you have to have the will to actually engage in the debate. And you're being told you're unreasonable. And then you are unreasonable. And then you make it happen. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Ryan, do you want to jump in here? And you, no, I, look, I think. You position yourselves as sort of value add investors, right? So you don't just write a check and you walk away. You, you get in there. You bring, you bring your business acumen, your prowess around change management and focus on mission and all of that. H how do we bring that business acumen to this space? I think there are, there's a lot of things in this country in, in kind of the West in general that are problematic around how we value things based on what we pay people. So it's not just nonprofit, it's education, it's teachers, it's healthcare mm -hmm. providers. So I, you know, I, I, I agree strongly. I think it's a pretty tough nut to crack this kind of, uh, this idea that we could change compensation. So over time, mm -hmm. maybe we'll, we'll pay folks in the nonprofit world as much as we will in the for-profit world. Um, I think one of, one of the things that I've seen time and time again in my business when we take companies private or buy them is there's been mission creep for the organization. And in conjunction with that mission creep, the political aspects of building out a bureaucracy have become so important that uh, there was a less effective, uh, there, was, there wasn't enough change man, constant change management going on at the organization. And I think this is something, unfortunately, that happens in the NGO world a lot. And so I think part of why people created this metric around you know, organizational efficiency or mm -hmm. to attempt to identify organizational efficiency through this one ridiculous metric is because people were tired of organizations getting large, adding planks to their nonprofit, and then seeing their CEOs or heads of the organization get paid so much, and then never really understanding what the true effectiveness of the organization was. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the ways that we could change this, Tom, is really define, going back to what you said, Todd, you know, what are you trying to accomplish? You know, and what, that's one of the benefits in the for-profit world, if you will. So in our companies, you know, at any given time, we have what we call KPIs. So, mm -hmm. Is it millions of lines of code? Is it product out the door? You know, over time, it might be financial indicators, although those tend to be trailing indicators. But what are the things that we're trying to do from a metric standpoint to identify whether we're making progress? Mm -hmm. You know, at Global Wildlife, we focus on um, 
certain scientific milestones before we focus on any conservation project. Yeah. And we also have to focus on metrics around local and indigenous buy-in because, you know, if you're going to do a project in these different parts of the world, you have to make sure it's not just going to be successful in the first couple of days. And then we track it afterwards. Yeah. So you can't say mission accomplished after you've built a $7 million nature preserve in parts of the world where they may not appreciate or respect private property or even public property. So you have to have the metrics around how you're going to do that. I think when you, when the industry effectively changes to some of those things, it'll be easier to convince donors and institutions that people who drive their organizations using those metrics mm -hmm. deserve similar compensation to what they've got in other places. But I think it's really tough. And I had this, you know, I was, I was, you know, Back then, I was young. Uh, when when we started Global Wildlife, and we didn't just start Global Wildlife, I went out and met with all the organizations that purported to do you know species preservation and wildlife conservation. And I asked these types of questions around metrics and analytics, and how do you guys track it, and how do you focus on your effectiveness? And they wanted to talk about all these offices that they had built in all these countries <laughs> around the planet. And I was like, God, it's you know 2000. Wow. Eight, it doesn't seem like offices and country X is really the, the, the metric we should focus on as the forest around that office is burning down. So I think when we drive those things, we're going to see compensation change. And what I would love is to tie the compensation in the NGO world to those types of metrics, just like we do in, in our own investment and in uh, for-profit world. Yeah, great. OK, Marlo, I want to ask you to, to jump yeah. in here as well. I mean, the, the Tanner Project Foundation, you guys are a, your lean mean fighting machine, right? So you, you don't have the that my dad and my son. Yeah, <laughs> so, Glenn, the, the, yeah. So, you, you, yeah. so the bureaucracy is not the issue, and if it is, that's another issue. Right. But um, yeah. um, but how how do you um, how do you stay effective? How do you think about all the tools that, that you have to, to to bring to bear? Well, for us, collaborate it's, with it, it's very personal, and it's a like I said, it's a personal story because it's what happened. Um, Collaboration is so important in the medical world, and what we learn, we share with others, and we want other people to share with us because that's how we're going to figure this thing out is by is by sharing our work and our research. Um, I, I for me to continually tell my story is is the tool I use every day because if I'm in the grocery store and I tell the person next to me what happened and they have cancer in their family, they're like, wait a second, I'm going to go get tested and. I could have saved their life. I might have saved their life. I probably did if something. And I've had people call me and tell me mm -hmm. um, uh, that things have, their lives have been different after hearing our story. Um, I, I, I want to say that every day technology is moving in a good direction. Years ago, people weren't getting their genome sequence. The, it was obscene how much it costs. So many people now can afford to do that. And you have companies like Color Genomics, which is up in Northern California, and I've worked with them, and they haven't. Uh, test for $249, which is affordable, where they send you a kit at home and they test for 30 cancer genes, including the P53, including BRCA, and you're spitting in a tube. You're doing it in the privacy of your home. You're not involving your doctor. You're not involving your insurance companies. And it's someone's first step to finding out what their genes are. And I think it's just getting people, it's more affordable for people to do. And um, I just can't speak enough about what happened to us if it could help someone else. Mm -hmm. Great. So, Tom, I think you were gonna, you were gonna jump in here, but let me give you one question to think about while you're sure. Here. <laughs> Is that okay? So, if we have 1.5 million nonprofits, should we, should they all be nonprofits? Should some of them actually be for profits? Um, I'll come to that question. <laughs> <clears throat> Maybe three things that I think are really worthy of talking about, and um, Brian and his uh, co-founder have a a uh, group of white papers, which are really best practices. And they are best practices, and they've used them as principles, tools, technique, technologies. And, and, and Brian can speak more eloquently about this, but I'll brag about how effective his firm has been is because of the documentation, codification of those, if you will, properties. And the consequence of that is their investment strategy and their returns have been pretty dramatically above the norm. And where is that in the context of the nonprofit world? Second point is in, in terms of um, science and metrics um, and being fact-based. 
we tend in the not-for-profit world to say, well, it's hard. We can't really measure it. It's how do you measure the value of a single life saved or one person who's touched or a pristine environment? At the Nature Conservancy, we have 600 um, scientists out of 3,500 employees, and we are very fact-based, and measuring, measuring nature is tough. We have two really gifted professors, one at Stanford and one up in Minnesota, who are constantly grouping, uh, co convening a group of really talented people from around the globe, trying to figure out how to value different aspects of nature. Um, and, and I think once we do do that, we will be able to then measure outcomes that people can say, okay, I get that. I get the value of that thing, whatever it is. And then um, thirdly, to your question, um, um, what would I say most effectively? Um, I guess I'd just say my thought is I come back to storytelling and um, using emotional hooks to really go after people and leverage them in ways that we historically have not. But now you're hearing people talk about the why as opposed to the how and the what. And we tend to spend, in the for-profit world, more time talking about the what and the how. Although the better companies, and if you have any doubts about this, start with the why, and then they go to the how and what. I think in the philanthropic world, we lose sight of the fact that the balance and the strength comes from talking about all three. But you got to start with the why. And that can be very disruptive. Great. OK. But um, you, you, uh, can I just? Yeah. So you asked about should they be nonprofit? Well, the question is, oh, how, should they, how should they be run? You know, and, and one thing that Tom and, and his board members did at Waller Creek, which is so effective, is they started one. And then they, they went about it the way you would do an effective startup. Mm -hmm. so they identify who's, who's the one person or the three people that could have done this before. You know, public-private partnership in a way that's going to impact you know a major city. Uh, what is the, what is their experience? And then they went after it. That's exactly mm -hmm. the way you would start a company. Yeah. You know, if you were well funded. And and then there's he's very modest. There's other things that they've done there yeah. that are have been incredibly effective, and that's why I think it's been such a successful outcome for the city of Austin. Yeah. Not enough of them work that way. Yeah. You know, and yeah. they need to have that same perspective for you know focused on outcomes. Great. May, may, I, yeah. may I add one thought? Though? Sure. In the context of, um, there are four founders of some microsystems. One of the founders, so the fond believer of, there's always more smart people outside the room and inside the room. And the question is, how can you bring them inside the room? Ergo, Sun was a very open source community, really into trying to figure out how to leverage other technologies. And in the world of philanthropy, we don't typically do that. So there's a professor at the University of Texas who visited with me years ago and said, you should uh, uh, meet me because one of our mutual friends said you should meet me. So I met him. And he had this great idea of having a student competition. And he was being told by other professors at the University of Texas that was too common an idea, too big. Um, there's lots of competitions, no differentiation. And so he explained to me what he was trying to do. And I said, well, I don't think you're thinking big enough. I think what we could do is that we could actually have a competition to solve some of the world's wicked problem by inviting everybody in the room. Don't limit the number of students. They can be eighth graders, seventh graders, sixth graders, high school students, graduates, didn't matter. And so we started that. And I said, if you do it, our family is willing to cede the funding for the first few years. And let's go Texas first, national second, global third. We did that. In the third year, Dell Computer Corporation, now Dell Inc., um, formed um, a group that came in and said, well, we'd like to fund that. And they made a really large contribution to the University of Texas, timed it over several years. And in about the third year of that competition, we had literally uh, probably about um, over 30,000 students competing for different prizes each year, solving local problems that had global implications. And if you have any interest in that, I would heighten your interest perhaps by teasing you with the following. We ultimately um, had the woman who was running the program inside the University of Texas spin that out as a company called Verb. Mm -hmm. And Verb is now a for-profit company because everything we were doing as a not-for-profit, we could do as for-profit. And we've evolved it to where literally um, you can take, and I'm fond of saying this, um, how many of you have looked at millennials as a um, high churn or turnover in your employee population. Well, the Deloitte study that came out last year is one in four are going to churn within 12 months, given the choice. If you take it out two years, it's 44%. If you go out four years to 2020 from last year, it's literally two and three. 
they want purpose. Well, you can give them purpose inside your company through companies like Verb, or Verb in particular, because you can be local in Singapore and helping an entrepreneur, and being a social entrepreneur mentor coach in UAE or some other country. And you can effectively sell employees' loyalty, and, uh, or companies' loyalty, rather, and employees' purpose. Great. So, Sorry. Todd, I think there's a, a, a lot to yeah. unpack there. We can talk about human capital. How do you attract the right talent? How do you bet on the right talent? And how do we think about sustainability? Look, I think, I think there's a couple ways that I've always thought about this stuff. You know, I want to I wanna talk about nonprofits. I also want to get to the movie industry for a second because there's mm -hmm. a parallel here. And obviously, I've spent a lot of time in that industry. First off, to me, part of the problem with philanthropy has been, historically, it was after somebody made a lot of money and they were at a certain age, then they wrote a check. So these great minds who had built businesses and done amazing things, at the end of their lives, wrote a check. That, to me, has to change. I always say, you know, charity can't be at the kiddie table. It's got to be at the front table. It's got to be an important part of what every company does. It can't be an afterthought. It can't be, OK, let's write them a check so they'll go away and quit bothering us. It's got to be integrated into their culture and what they care about. And now let me pick on the movie industry for a second, just to, so that everybody doesn't think this is all about uh, the 501c3s, because it's just not true and it's not fair. I used to sit on the board, I still sit on the board of the AFI, the American Film Institute, with Jack Valenti. And if you guys know who Jack Valenti <laughs> was, he was the head of the Motion Picture Association for a very long time, and a great man. And we used to have long conversations. Obviously, our last names were right next to each other, so we sat next to each other a lot. And I come from technology. He comes from protecting that industry. Jack had a very famous quote back in the day that said, the VCR is going to do to the movie industry what Jack the Ripper did to women. <laughs> now, his quote was the meaning that technology was going to kill the movie industry, that this new digital world was absolutely going to rip it upside down. But the reality is the VCR and then the DVD and then digital has become you know, the biggest revenue generator for the movie industry that they have ever had. The movie industry, by the way, has fought every technology innovation for the last hundred years. <laughs> Television, cassette decks, jukeboxes, player pianos, I could go on and on and on. And so these industries that get incumbent, they resist change. Mm. So why would we think it any different with the big 501c3s? If you've been around a hundred years, you have no incentive to change until we give them an incentive to change. You have no incentive to be entrepreneurial if you're not incentivized to be entrepreneurial. Your job is not put at risk if you take chances. In fact, your job is put at risk if you do take chances. So until we change the mindset and the culture, and that's why I come back to I would like an objective source to study these companies and study these businesses and put together reports back to why Brian's company is so successful, because they have done that. They have looked at things and said, that's how we get best practices. That's how we take it to the next level. And until that happens, everybody just recreates the wheel. Every person that comes along, me included, says, well, what are we going to do different? I am very cautiously optimistic. One, obviously, I'm a huge fan of Bill Gates. Somebody who retires at his age and then devotes the rest of his life to philanthropy, I, I'm blown away by. So I'm a big fan of his. And I'm very, I'm very hopeful about Mark Zuckerberg who's taking an interest at a very young age in philanthropy and what he can do. That, to me, is a great change. You know, we talk about the millennials. And you know, one of the things I've observed with millennials when I'm in Silicon Valley or I'm giving a speech or whatever is people want to know an organization, what are you going to stand for? Is there a cause element to this? Is there, is there an impact element to this? And that matters. And it didn't used to matter. And it does to them now. And that gives me hope as well. Because if we get all these great minds around it, that's when something amazing can happen. So that, to me, is the, the mindset that has to change, is we just have to change the way it's looked at, the way it's perceived, and then encourage that. But more importantly, these organizations have to be compensated in accordance with the principles that we believe in as opposed to what we just say, so. Great. I'm going to pause and say, do we have questions in the audience? And I think we've got, a, we've got our mic coming up. Annette, you're close. Can you just want, Yeah. 
oh, this is amazing. But one of the things that I'm coming from the for-profit and I joined the non-profit five years ago. And so the questions that you keep getting from donors is how much money do you burn? Which is exactly to the point that you said, right? That money that is lost in talent. And then the, which was also something I was very shocked by. But the other thing, which I think is more a systematic thing, is that our organizations are measured by Charity Navigator. And the more, the more you don't spend on talent, the more stars you get, right? right? And then you go to your donors and they say, oh, you only have three stars, you should have four stars. So I think we, how much can we influence the measurement system in order to adapt to the, to the world that I really believe in? So what can we do to fight the system? I, I think the simple answer is we have to start talking about it and confronting the elephant in the room. And it's about how we are upside down societally because of how we have um, limited the amount of spend or burn um, by nonprofits because that determined how much was actually going to the cause. What we weren't doing um, was measuring the outcomes. And that which is, it gets really hard. Recently, and I would uh, take, I'd call out um, Darren Walker, who talked the other day here at the Milken Conference. He's the CEO of the Ford Foundation. Two years ago, many people probably don't know, but the Ford Foundation changed their whole philanthropic thrust. And the philanthropic thrust is now social inequality, fighting it globally. It's hard to measure. It was controversial. The program managers who were part of the bureaucracies within those groups had philanthropies that totally depended on them because they were funding them for years, decades in some cases. And the board said, no, we're going to stop. And I would say other organizations have to have the courage of that board. And in fact, one of the things that struck me was um, Darren quoted John Lewis, who's a, a fairly prominent um, civil rights leader and congressman. And he um, used the quote that terrorism is not our greatest enemy or threat. It's hopelessness. Mm. Yeah, I, you know, we've dealt with this for years in my, my for-profit company. Uh, you know, the, the metric in my industry has for decades been, well, how much did you pay for that? And so every time I buy a company, you know, one of the experts in the press likes to write an article all about how we've lost our minds and we paid so much for it. And then, you know, when we sell it for three times that, they never write about it. But, <laughs> you know, part of, part of how you confront this is, you, you know, one, you go to the constituents that matter. So from my perspective, when talking about how much I pay and what I return, I only talk to my limited partners. Because at the end of the day, my investors don't buy retail. You know, they're, they're investing in us and, and they want to know what the real story is. And I think that's part of what you do when you're trying to fundraise for nonprofit. You, you know, technology is changing this, but I would say historically, there was kind of a relatively small number of people who had an outsized impact financially on a bunch of nonprofits. So make sure they understand the story and understand that you know, it's not about the cost, it's about the investment. And then show them the returns, show them your outcomes. Because that's, I mean, most folks that I know who, who, who contribute, um, certainly at the levels I think we're talking about, uh, they're doing it because they believe deeply in the outcomes, that's what got them involved. And I think Marlo's story, you know, as, as Tom said, is so compelling. They want to know how many people they say there. So don't don't let them get caught up in this false metric. You know, focus them on you know the benefit and the whole reason why you're having the conversation. Great. Um, right down here. Thank you. Um, I launched my nonprofit last year. And I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful to get advice from all of you uh, in terms of what you think about grant writers. I'm a very, very small nonprofit. And uh, I've had a lot, of, a lot of conversations about possibly um, hiring a grant writer to help us get uh, you know, support, donations. But the cost right. is is prohibitive for us, us right now, uh, especially when they're talking about no guarantees. It's not as though they say you spend X amount of dollars with us and we guarantee that we will bring you this amount of money. I'd like to just get your opinion about small nonprofits and grant writers and whether you think they could be a benefit or is there some other way 
that is more innovative for a small nonprofit like myself to uh, attract uh, more support. Thank you. Do you want to go first? I'll go second. Sure. <laughs> I mean, again, to go back to the for-profit world, if you had a startup, you would come to someone and say, I'd like for you to invest in it. And you would try to attract maybe angel investors, maybe family and friends. If you got to a certain level, maybe venture capital people. And you would run the tricks, and you would have to convince them, right, that you had this amazing company. So to me, grant writing is just one possible revenue stream for your, for your foundation and for what you're starting. And it's just one of the sources that are out there. And yes, I'm certainly not an expert in grant writing by any stretch of the imagination. But yeah, it's, it's like hiring a salesperson. You know, you don't know if they can sell until you've hired them, and then you have to decide if they've delivered on what they said they could do. And so there is an outlay if you're gonna go that route. I, you know, I don't know enough about grant writing to say whether that's a good investment or not. I know it's very difficult, I know it's complicated, and I also know, though, there's people that are very good at it and seem to be able to get funds for what it is they wanna do. So, to me, it's just one arrow in your quiver of choices, and you have to figure out, are there other options to raise money or to do the things you wanna do, or is that the best one? So, so there are metrics, interestingly, for the effectiveness of grant writing in terms of I've written 20 grants and I have a 20% hit rate or a 10% hit rate or I've written um, 20 and I have no hits. There's also for development directors, think sales, um, a payback that's usually a, a multiple of their salary and they usually self-fund within um, 9 to 12 months and by the year two they should be getting that multiple, whatever that multiple is. So. Um, what you have to do is convince the angel, apparently you're the first angel, you got to get a second angel that's willing to fund either a development director or a grant writer who has a high success rate historically. Um, and if it's a local charity, then you want to hire somebody who's done that locally, ideally, that has a higher hit rate. Okay, I'm going to take moderator's prerogative to throw another question out to the group. Um, we talked to, we've talked a lot about a different, different kinds of levers. What about policy? And, and the role of, of nonprofits in being advocates and, and working in the policy space, particularly in this time in our history where we're seeing federal funding in areas that we all care about, you know, potentially being cut pretty drastically. Anyone want to take that on? Um, I just had the privilege of hearing President Bush, whose politics are perhaps different than my own personally. Um, uh, be recognized for what he did in the context of AIDS while he was president in Africa. And um, he was attributed as having been uh, the hero for saving 25 million lives. And he actually uh, wisely, in my opinion, said, no, the American people are the heroes. Because that happened because he had Senators Frist and Senators Kerry, a bipartisan effort, because we could not let that happen. Um, and he thought it was in our security, national security interest. And that was a public policy. It was a really um, sure, tough decision given everything else that we were having in, in the way of budget discussions back then. Um, policy matters. So in the, in the context of, for example, um, actually, uh, Brian's charity in terms of rhinos and elephants and um, one of the things that uh, a group that's in the space that he's involved in is very focused on limiting demand. So one of the big successes this past year was getting um, in China, ivory um, banned in terms of contraband uh, because what was happening is people were poaching in Africa and the elephant population was diminishing very rapidly. And that's great, except um, that's one policy on the demand side. But what about the supply side? Because if you're in Africa in certain villages and you have a, a surfeit of elephants, and you need to make a living, you have to figure out how to deal with that part and can you do sustainable harvesting of older elements. Uh, and I'm not gonna debate which one's right, but usually the genius of the end is better than the tyranny of the order. All right, let's go back to the, the audience down here. There's going to be a hearing tomorrow morning on the Johnson Amendment. And the Johnson Amendment will repeal the prohibition against 501c3s engaging in partisan politics. 
And I was wondering that as investors and drivers and entrepreneurs, if you have any idea, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, letting you know that a lot of the large nonprofit coalitions are totally against it because we believe then we'd be bled for donations and endorsements that uh, are counter to our missions. I think it's a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> Look, and I'm against Citizens United. That probably tells you a little bit more about my politics. So I think we had to figure out how the public financing of, edu of elections. And at some point in our history, I'd like to think we're going to be wise enough to do that. Because the notion that we have to spend billions of dollars on presidential campaigns and millions and tens of millions of dollars on, depending upon the television market you're in, um, congressional and senatorial campaigns, makes no sense. Yeah, I mean, I think it's already covered by other entities now. So, you know, why C3s need to be there, I'm not, I'm not sure it makes sense, but. I think it's, it, it continues to be there, you know, there's a number of people who, who want to be involved in advocacy. And I think they've recognized that because of prior activity, they've become known for a certain thing or maybe even polarizing. And so it's a continued trend of being, people trying to mask where they're coming from. And so they obviously Citizens United was part of this and people set up these packs and whatnot. And I think this is another example of it. You know, they want they want bastions of credibility to be voices for their perspective. Brian, can I ask you a question? And we talk a lot about we've been talking about philanthropy taking on these huge, complex, intractable problems, really systems problems, and, and yours, of course, falls into to that category. So if you're, you're looking at a, a, a whole system, but yet you've decided to go pretty narrow in <coughs> on one piece of that, how, how do you balance that of sort of knowing where, sort of determining, do I go narrow, do I go broad, when I'm trying to make a, a, a when I'm trying to improve the entire system? Yeah, so I think one of the things that was so important when we started Global Wildlife is we asked ourselves a lot of questions around how are we going to define success? Uh, because, the, you know, the problems we are trying to solve are very large. And we took a look at the talent that, you know, was prodigious at GWC, but, you know, we don't have a thousand people. And so where can we be most effective? Um, because these things need to involve multiple constituencies and stakeholders, and our work does involve them. And so what we do, sadly, there are lots of species at risk of extinction, and so we, we base it on our, inter our internal expertise, um, the relationships that we have, and the locales in the world where we have in-country partners. So it is system wide. So if you look at you know what we've done recently in Suriname, you know seven million acre nature that's pretty big, uh, and that's because we had very specific scientific uh, credibility there in conjunction with a government that's very focused on preserving their natural world and indig indigenous peoples who need it every day to survive. Um, and so we kind of took a sniper shot approach, and that's what we try and do is and because we are kind of what's the successful outcome going to be and go backward from there. That's how we kind of think about our projects. Um, and, and quite admittedly, we are a smaller organization and we want kind of a batting average of a thousand. So we take that approach. Mm -hmm. When you are a much larger organization, I think it's a little bit tougher because you have these donor dependencies. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's a, it's a real challenge, and I you know I, I certainly don't want to be judgmental. In GWC's case, we created it so we wouldn't have those issues. Yeah. Um, but you know, if you want to affect change, you have to listen to what your donors want. But oftentimes, the donors aren't the experts, and that's why you end up with this mission creep. So you kind of have this balance. Yeah. But that's how we you know created our organization. What's success to us? What does it look like? And then go backwards from there. Great. Okay, so we're getting into our lightning round. Um, so we're gonna have to wrap, wrap up, but I'm sure people are gonna stay to talk with, to talk with you all later. So Marlo, start us off with our lightning round in terms of you know, what, what is the, 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 the top piece of advice that you wanna to impart to, to the audience in terms of you know, your, your lessons learned about Knowledge is power. Knowledge. I mean, it's, it's knowledge is power. It's scary to know what genes you may have, but it's scarier. The unknown is scarier. And I think we have this next generation, my daughter's generation, whatever you, everyone wants to call it, because um, <laughs> that's a whole other panel. And so I think it's important for those 
young adults to know that they have choices before they go and have kids and to know their family genomics and genetics. My daughter started her own initiative with genomegeneration.com. And I think it's just important for everyone. We owe it to our children, to our grandchildren, to our family to know what our genes are. Knowledge is power. Tom, what do you want to leave folks with? Be disruptive. Follow your dreams and don't accept the word no. I like that. Brian? You know, if you're starting a nonprofit, what are you trying to solve and how are you going to measure whether or not you've been successful? And I think if you kind of divine that early on, you'll be ahead of the game and it'll be easier for you to raise money. I think for me, just know that technology is going to move, I think, faster the next 10 years than it has the previous 50. It's one of the conversations I have with Mark all the time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it may be VR and AR and AI and all sorts of little initials that are out there and things we haven't even thought of yet and deep machine learning and everything that's going to dramatically change even the conversations we're having today at a clip that, that makes a lot of us shudder. And so I think it's going to be a very exciting next few years, not just in this industry, but across the board, because it's no longer just business and then technology. Technology is just in every business. We don't all shudder at that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Tom, Tom's going to. I'd like to. Um, I, I just asked Melissa if I could end with a quote. And when I was hearing the word no in connection with um, a philanthropy that I'm heavily involved with, I came across um, Thoreau's quote. Go confidently in the direction of your dreams. Live the life you have imagined. May you live that life. Yeah. And I'm going to give you one more quote. Oh, good. <laughs> I love quotes. Yeah. <laughs> From Archimedes, who when he was studying the physical principles of leverage said, give me a place to stand and I shall move the earth. And I think all of our speakers here are doing just that. So please join me in thanking all of them. And thank you so much for joining us.